This is a continuation video. This is video number two in the sequence. Notice I said sequence, not series. Uh, in uh, So there's a sequence of videos on Taylor series. So I hope you've watched the first video. In this video, we're going to go through all of the key ideas that were sort of laid out um, using the function sine of x. And we're going to do a lot of different things with this function. I'm going to encourage you uh, at some point to take a break in this video. So there'll be some intermission slides. And I want you to pause, maybe watch that part again if you really want, or something like that, because there's, there's a couple themes here. So there's two ways to ask the question that we're about to answer right now. One is find the Taylor series of sine of x centered at a is equal to 0. And when you have the center being 0, that's just the same thing as saying find the Maclaurin series of f. So what do you do? Take your function sine of x, <coughs> find every single derivative. We've just computed an, a couple of these just to show what's going on. Um, then you need to plug in. Uh, step two, you have to plug in a uh, the a value, which is zero right now. So replace all of the x's with a, namely zero. And so then you have sine of zero, cosine zero, negative sine of zero, negative cosine zero. Those simplify right there. We're just going to copy this information on the bottom half of the slide to the next slide. Now to find the coefficients, um, notice this. First of all, if i is even, so that's the 0, 4, 8, 12, 2, 6, 10, 14, and so on. Then you get a 0. Okay, c sub i is 0 because the numerator is 0, and who cares what the denominator is? So all we have to really worry about right now are what are c sub odd? What's c1? What's c3? What's c5? Those are the only numbers that are going to be interesting due to the 1 and the minus 1. And let's just, you know, plug in and just figure out, right? So c sub 1, take this number, divide by 1 factorial. c sub 3, well, that's take this number, take the negative 1, divide by 3 factorial, c sub 5, go back to the positive 1, divide by 5 factorial, and so on and so forth. So you see 1 factorial, 3 factorial, 5 factorial, 7 factorial, and you see a plus 1, a minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, and so on. Ooh, th this is a typo. There should be a minus 1 right there. So then what? Then uh, from this, you have a Taylor series uh, for sine of x. Um, and all it is is, uh, I mean, this is actually a Maclaurin series. That's why it's not x minus a, but just x minus 0. So we didn't write that. Um, but you just take this, and that's the coefficient of x to the first. This is the coefficient of x to the third. This is the coefficient of x to the fifth. This number right here is the coefficient of x to the seventh, as you see right there. What's the coefficient of x squared, for instance? Well, that c sub 2 is 0, so the coefficient is 0. So here's the Taylor series for sine of x. We'll write that back over here, just from the previous slide. And um, while it's nice to have this in this long format, how about writing this in short form using sigma notation? Well, notice what we're going to need is we're going to need a formula for every other odd uh, every other number, uh, so every odd number, for instance, this 1, 3, 5, 7, you see that again with the exponent, 1, 3, 5, 7. And the formula that will give that to you is something like this, 2j plus 1. And you don't have to use a j, but I've been using i earlier, and I think using a new index will make uh, this make a little bit more sense. So if you do the pattern recognition on this, you should come up with this series. And you can try the same thing with cosine. So let's take, sorry, let me take, let's take this power series right here. This is the Maclaurin series, uh, written two different ways. But let's take the sigma notation version and answer the question, what is the interval of convergence and radius of convergence for this Taylor series? Remember, a Taylor series is a, just a special kind of power series. And a power series is just uh, a series that has an x to raised to a power somewhere in there. So we want to answer the interval of convergence question, meaning which x's could you plug in and have this more ordinary looking series, more ordinary infinite series, once you plug in a number, what number could you plug in so that this series converges? Well, so let's just pluck out the, the jth term. That's everything other than the sigma. And then if you plug in j plus 1, uh, here it is, and you could clean this up using some algebra. So sorry for how messy this is, but if you clean this up, uh, you'll get something like this first, and then you might want to write this out this way. This is to anticipate some cancellation, which will occur. Um, well, uh, due to the factorial, which appeared, it made sense to think of the ratio test. So here we set up the ratio of the, the next term and the previous term, and you get something like this. I didn't show the work here, but you should FOIL this out in the denominator, apply um, I guess not L'Hopital's here because you really have a fixed number for fixed x over a growing number. As j gets big, the denominator is big. So no L'Hopital's here. This is just fixed over growing, and that's equal to 0.
Well, if you get a zero uh, for the limit of the sequence that you study in the ratio test, the ratio test says that this series here is going to converge no matter what x is. So no matter what real number you get. That means that the interval of convergence is all reals, and the radius of convergence is uh, declared to be infinity. What that means for us is that sine of x, the function we were finding the power series for, is actually equal to this formula, this power series, for all numbers. You pick a real number x, and sine of x in radians is the same thing as plugging in for x into this right here. This is a good time to take a break. All right, so I just wanted to recall, here was the short, compact form of sine of x that we saw. And now let's talk about Taylor polynomials. So if we write out this thing in longhand notation again, we get something like this. But I like to write this out in even more longhand notation by including all of the terms, including those that have a 0. So the constant is actually 0. And then here's this 1x. I've been careful to write out the 1. Then there's a 0x squared. Okay. Then here's this uh, plus, and I was intentional to use plus signs throughout, so to take care of this minus sign here, I wrote negative 1 over 3 factorial, and I wrote, even wrote this x cubed off to the side. Then there's a 0x to the fourth, uh, and so on and so forth. So this 0, that's c sub 0. This 1 is c1. This is c2. This fraction, namely negative 1 over 3 factorial, that's c3. c6 is 0. c7 is negative 1 over 7 factorial, and so on. Now, the whole point of writing out all these terms like this is this makes it easier to talk about what are, what's a Taylor polynomial. Because the Taylor polynomials are just the partial sum. So if you just take just this term right here, that's t sub 0. And we'll talk about Taylor's inequality. You might want to watch this part of the video several times, but I've highlighted uh, the use of n in the book. And But let's just look up here for a second. Here's t1, there's t2, here's t3, here's t4, here's t5. And this goes on and on, of course. But let's stop with this. This is t5. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms. 6 terms just because you included this. And let's look at what Taylor's inequality says. So r sub n is the function you have minus t sub n. And um, since we're talking about derivatives of sine, that's either sine or cosine, plus or minus, that is. And so 1 is a good number that will upper bound the absolute value of any derivative of sine. And so something like this, this inequality here, if you plug in 1, is true for any derivative of sine. I mean, this is true for all reals, but in particular, the inequality, the, the theorem requires this to be true a certain distance that the book called d away from the center, which we're using as 0. So I used pi for d just, just because. I just picked something. And so then what Taylor's inequality gives you, if you just plug in, you see the inequality, uh, you'll get something that looks like this. Now on the next slide, we're just going to take this and clean this up a little by removing the minus zeros and such. So let's do that on the next slide. So just, just to recall, here's t sub 5 from the previous slide. Just I excluded all the zero terms. And here's r sub 5. And what the Taylor's inequality said, the conclusion, the last bullet on the previous slide said this. And uh, as an example, if you plug in x is equal to negative 3, negative 3 works. If you absolutely value that, that's smaller than pi. So plug in a negative 3 for the x there and there, and you get this inequality right there. And what does this inequality even mean? This says that if you look over here, that the values of these two things don't differ by so much. So let's really write this out. I'm going to write out right here t sub 5 okay, of plugging plug in the number negative 3. And I just plugged in for each of the x's the number negative 3. Didn't even clean that up. Um, also sine of x, let's plug in negative 3. And what this inequality is really is saying is that these two numbers, namely this first number right here, okay, that number, and then this second number that we computed, these two numbers are within uh, 1 over 6 factorial times uh, absolute value of negative 3 to the 6th power of each other. That's how close these numbers are to each other. Now for this to make some sense, let's go to the graph. So here's sine of x. Okay, That's f of x. That's sine of x here. We can also graph the, the Taylor polynomial of degree 5, that's this function that is drawn in red. And let's look at what happens at the x value negative 3. That's somewhere very close to this negative pi. And we get the y value of sine and the y value of this 
uh, function called t sub 5. And look, these y values are not so far apart from each other. I wanted to pick something even uh, where you see they're, they're closer, but then the picture wouldn't make much sense. But these two y values, I don't know how close these are, but I know that if I subtracted the two y values, it's going to be smaller than this number right here. This is an, a good time to take yet another break. All right, so um, if you, what we're going to do is we're going to piggyback off of what we know about uh, the Taylor series for sine of x. So if you wanted to find a Taylor series for x to the seventh time sine of x, you could use a general method um, and you could find derivatives of this function, but g prime, g double prime, g triple prime, and the fourth and fifth derivative and so on, this won't have a really nice pattern anymore because the product rule is going to sort of screw things up. So instead, we're going to use this Taylor series that we found earlier to make things so much simpler. So start with the series, okay, start with this, and now just uh, the series that we want is not sine of x anymore. We want x to the seventh times sine of x. So fine, just multiply by x to the seventh on both sides. So on the left, you just now have x to the seventh sine of x. On the right, here's this x to the seventh. I just rewrote the series, but now you can distribute this x to the seventh in. And there it is. It appears right there. And just using some algebra, you could rewrite this as x to the 2j plus 8. That 8 is the, the 1 plus the 7, of course. Uh, let's do this one more time. Um, now not with uh, multiplication, but same thing. Instead of finding the Taylor series for sine of x squared by finding a bunch of derivatives, um, this won't be so nice because the chain rule this time is going to screw things up. So instead, same thing, just use the, the Taylor series for sine of x that we computed earlier. And instead of multiplying by something, that's not going to be helpful. Here, let's replace every x with an x squared. So all I'm going to do is replace the x here and the x there. There are no other x's, just these two. Replace them both with x squared. So here it is, x squared, there's x squared. Now just using some algebra, you can rewrite this uh, as x to the 4j plus 2. And now let's do something with this. Okay. I mean, we just computed a Taylor series for sine of x squared, but now let's do something really fun with this. We can integrate this function now. So there's no nice uh, formula for this derivative. Uh, so how are we going to do this integral? Well, let's just use what we found on the previous slide. Sine of x squared is actually equal to this. So instead of integrating this thing, instead of integrating sine of x squared, let's integrate this power series instead. So just to make sure that we're doing the steps kind of slowly enough, let's just look at for this definite integral, let's only let's just look at the indefinite form of this integral, um, or in other words, the indefinite form of this integral. And by doing the anti-differentiation here, uh, notice the sigma stayed because we're just integrating one term at a time. All this stuff stayed, but now the x to the 4j plus 2, raise the power up by 1 and divide by that power. This is just the power rule, and of course, a plus c for this indefinite integral. Fine, then to go back to the definite integral here, um, all we do now is take this formula for the for this antiderivative that we found, ignore the plus c, of course, just as you always do in fundamental theorem of calculus 2, and take this and plug in for the x. What are we going to plug in? We're going to plug in this number 7 right here. right? So this x that's right there got replaced with the 7 that's right here, and that's, that's the 7 that you see here. But then we're not done. You have to take this x for the second piece of the fundamental theorem. 2. Replace the x now with the number 0 that you see here. So that's why this x was replaced with 0 that you see here. But if you look and stare at this long enough, you have 0 to a power. So that's just 0. Here you're just adding a bunch of zeros. So this second set of brackets, that's actually the, the number 0. So let's not subtract this at all since it's just 0. And so this simplifies to just this first power series, right? Well, not power series anymore. Since we substituted the x, this is now just an ordinary series. So before you looked at power series, you could have been given this question and asked things such as, does this series converge or diverge? That's the end of the second video.